our final speaker against the motion. More of that later. Uh, our final speaker against the motion is another philosopher. Uh, he is Roger Scruton, who has written many books upon his subject. He's written about uh, aesthetics, he's written about music, philosophy of architecture, and he's written a book called Philosophy, Principles and Problems, into which perhaps this motion fits. So please welcome Roger Scruton. Thank you very much, and Chairman, and thank you everybody for being here for this extraordinary debate. Uh, Rabbi Julia Neuberger asked, um, or suggested I might uh, say something about my own connection with Methodist Hall. All I can say is that um, my father, when it crossed his mind that perhaps he should not bring his children up entirely without religion, searched our local ta town, High Wycombe, for the gloomiest chapel he could find. It, it was the Methodist, and we were duly sent there each Sunday. He not, of course, attending, being a, uh, which, hoping to hope, ca uh, keep hold of the remaining bits of uh, cheerfulness in his already gloomy personality. <laughs> uh, and um, this had a very remarkable effect on me. It meant that I um, secretly went every Sunday, not to the Methodist chapel, but to the Anglican church, uh, uh, and also to confirmation lessons thereafter, not unconnected with the presence at those lessons of a very attractive girl in a white Macintosh. <laughs> uh, this was my first encounter with um, that aspect of the religious experience which some people call transcendental. Uh, and I, I have held on to it ever since, and I entirely agree with our first speaker, Dr. Spivey, that this is something that will never be removed from the human condition. Now, I have to speak as a philosopher, so I refer to one of the great philosophers, Plato, who set out to describe an ideal republic in which reason would prevail over passion and in which the citizens would be guided by the truth. It is fair to say that Plato found ordinary humanity to be a profound disappointment, as do most of the speakers on the other side. In all kinds of ways, people conspired against their own happiness by allowing the darker forces within to gain the upper hand. They amused themselves with poetry, which told them lies about the heroes and gods. In politics, they preferred consoling lies to uncomfortable truths, and so tied themselves in knots of self-deception. When it came to music, they had a distressing tendency to prefer the orgi orgiastic tunes and rhythms uh, of the pop stars, instead of the, the upright marches which bring order to the soul. All in all, human beings as they existed in Plato's day were on the side of disorder, falsehood, and irrationality. The only solution was to devise a new kind of society with the philosophers in charge and the forces of unreason expelled into the outer darkness. The poets would be ordered to leave, so too would the priests of Dionysus and other orgiastic cults, so too would the Corybants and the pop stars. People would be educated on a diet of pure philosophy which would ensure that reason prevailed in every decision and that the soul of the citizen would be as well-ordered and harmonious as the soul of the state. Plato was only one of the many thinkers down the ages who have advocated an ideal of reason and reasonableness and who have dismissed those aspects of the human condition which fail to conform to it. Plato was ambivalent about religion since he believed that it had both rational and irrational forms but he was adamant that the irrational forms were dangerous and that we, we would be better off without, him, without them. Suppose someone were to say that we would be better off without love. After all, love often leads to disaster. The love of Helen for Paris, for instance, which led to the Trojan War. Love brings with it jealousy, possessiveness, obsession, and grief. People can love the wrong things and the wrong people. They can go astray through love as they do through hatred. Most people in this room, I hope, would respond to that argument in the following way. They would say, whatever the disasters that love may cause, love judged in itself and without regard to contingencies is a human good, perhaps the greatest of human goods. The important thing is to learn to love rightly and in the right frame of mind. The disasters, if they come, <clears throat> come as accidents and not by necessity. 
That is surely the, the response that should be made on behalf of religion. Of course, religion leads to disasters like the Thirty Years' War. People can believe in false gods, attach themselves to evil rituals, and so on. Religion can have, exert a stultifying effect on the intelligence, imagination, and humanity of those who subscribe to it. Do we think that that is not true also of science sometimes? Anyway, none of those possibilities implies that there is not a proper development of the religious urge in which people learn to worship the right things in the right way. Christopher Hitchens travels around the world looking, uh, visiting places beginning with the, word, with the letter B uh, and dis discovering all around him insoluble conflicts. Maybe that's partly his problem, but uh, I, of course those problems, those conflicts exist. But is religion the cause of them or just one of the ways in which they are expressed? Visiting one of those places beginning with the letter B once, uh, namely Beirut, in the middle of the Civil War, I went out of the city to a nunnery nearby, in the countryside nearby, in which all kinds of uh, victims of the Civil War had, been, had found refuge and were being looked after by a little nun. And I said to her, how on earth can you cope with this uh, influx of damaged people? What are you to do about it? And she said to me something very simple. She said, que le bon Dieu est, est bon. On lui donne comme ça, et il nous rend comme ça. She opened her arms and said, he gives us back ten times what we offer him. And what had he offered her? He had offered her the ability to look after damaged people of every faith and restore them to a sense of normality and to live life again. That seemed to me to be an adequate expression of the religious urge. Now, but to, to defend the religious urge, we have to know what kind of thing we, as religious people, are. And this is the place where philosophy has something to say. What part of our nature draws us to religion? And what is needed if that part is to be rightly guide, guided? 